Welcome back, everyone. Um, let's then now proceed with a plea of guilty. A plea of guilty is governed by Section 110.12 of the Criminal Procedure Act. So a plea of guilty is when your client admits responsibility where your client admits all the elements of the offense and he pleads to the merits of the case. So there is nothing that your client will then be disputing. He just wants, uh, he just accepts everything and wants then the matter to then be finalized. And should it then be that your client uh, pleads guilty such a client can then be used as well as by the state or by uh, uh, normally in practice it happens in the form of the state where the state can call this person as a witness if there were multiple uh, accused persons. So this is very, very, very important to then say that the, your client must know to then say that he is he is a competent and a compelable witness. The state can then call him to the stand. And once he accepts responsibility, then he or she will then be convicted and then be sentenced. And the court will satisfy itself if whether the client admits all the elements as well as the state accepting the guilty plea. So what normally happens in practice, your matter will then be called and from there the prosecutor will read out the charge to then say this is case number so and so, this is the matter between the state and so and so, and the client is the accused is pleading guilty to the charge, let's say of theft, then they, 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 he or she will then read it out to say on or about such and such a date, the accused did unlawfully and intentionally take whatever to wit they must be named belonging to so and so as well as the jurisdiction is very important because should it then be then that the jurisdiction is not of this court then this court can hear such a matter so these are some of the elements you have to take note of to then say that yes even if your client is accepting responsibility but does the, this court have jurisdiction to hear this matter. If yes, then you then now proceed. So as I said, is section 112, then out of section 112, we have various form. We have section 1121A, of which is for less serious offenses. We have section 11B, of which this one is where the court questions your client, then we have section 112, subsection 2, where you as the legal representative will then be uh, preparing a guilty plea and reading out to the court. So let, these are the three guilty pleas. Then let's start with section 1121A. With this one is where the accused on his own accord accept responsibility without being asked any question by anyone. So normally what happens is by him accepting responsibility, normally the defense and the state will agree. Can we proceed in terms of section 1121A? But you will be putting the prosecutor in a corner in a sense that this is uh, crucial in terms of well, sentence. No. Pardon? This is very crucial because the, can, can, the court rather cannot exceed the fine which, is, uh, which has then been set by the minister. So this is very important. 
one one two one a less offenses you don't prepare anything you don't draft anything you just stand up to then say the defense and the state have agreed that the court may proceed in terms of the provisions of section 112 subsection 1 sub subsection a of the criminal of uh, procedure act and the court will then say you are found guilty as charged by the mere fact that on your own accord you have then accepted a responsibility and if you can see on the slides to then say that if the court is of the view that the punishment that they he will impose might exceed the determined uh, um, fine that was um, said by the minister or he may give an uh, he may give direct imprisonment the court might not accept the plea so that is why if you and the state have agreed it's best to then say that both the defense and the state have agreed to this but there are some of the presiding officers who do not want this section because they are of the view that this section is for someone who is not legally represented because the section uh, 112 subsection 2 whereby as a legal defense is your responsibility to draft a guilty plea for your client so for less offenses where the fine doesn't have to an, exceed an amount of 5,000 rents, and then that's when we will then have to uh, plead guilty in terms of section 1121A. But don't be surprised if maybe when you suggest this to the prosecutor, the prosecutor says no, as the prosecutor is dominus litus, and would then say, uh uh, now nah, I suggest that I will ask a fine exceeding this amount, which means then you then have to then draft. That's 1121A. Then, uh, like as I said, you the accused person is convicted without any questions being asked and may not impose a suspended sentence, which is very. Uh, this is very important. Yes, just hold on for a second. What happened now? Uh, as I say, I'm sorry, I'm having some uh, connectivity issues. I'll be with you now. Now, give me a second. I'll be back now. Yeah, as I say, sorry about that. Uh, we are still trying to upload the 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 other batch of uh, slides. Uh, now I would like to proceed in terms of section 112, subsection one, subsection B. So um, this... may I uh, excuse okay. me? Yeah. May I request that you go back to the previous screen, just for okay. me to take a screenshot? I missed something there. Okay uh and then the next screen thank you so much thank you okay yeah as i say we will uh continue to upload them and as i say now we are continuing with section 112 subsection 1 subsection b this is whereby the court asks 
the accused person questions, the court will like to uh, satisfy itself if whether the accused person really admits responsibility, really admits all the elements of the offense. So the, question, the court is going to ask him questions based on him uh, pleading guilty to the offense. And once the court is then satisfied to then say that uh, the client accepts responsibility, then the court will then uh, ask the prosecutor if she is she accepts the plea. And then if the prosecutor accepts the plea, then the client will then be sentenced. And this one, the sentence is very um, broad. It goes with the discretion of the of the presiding officer. So section 1121B, the court asks questions whereby your client or the unrepresented uh, accused person is being asked questions by the by the court. And from there, it then uh, happens to it to then say that uh, the court is satisfied. Can I have uh, some few minutes so that I check the other slides before we continue? Because there's, uh, there's a lot of them. I'll be with you. Please bear with me. Sorry, ma'am, can I ask you questions while you are busy uploading? Yes, ma'am. I just want to find out uh, what happens if someone admits guilt on behalf of someone else, so they actually take the blame and um, Will the court accept that and then just not further investigate if that person admits guilt? Repeat, repeat that. If the sorry, if someone admits guilt on behalf of someone else, yes. um, say they didn't really commit the crime, but they say that they were the one that commits the crime. Oh, yes. Will the court yes. accept that and then just not um, proceed to investigate? Uh, it's not the duty of the court to uh, to to investigate. The sorry, the when someone accepts responsibility, the court will then ask that person. Let's say, like for instance, in terms of section 112, subsection two, the court will then ask you, do you confirm what your attorney has read into the record? Do you understand? what your attorney has placed before this court. Do you admit to everything that your attorney said? So which means then the court uh, satisfies itself to then say then that the client really ad admits responsibility. So at a later stage, the client can come up and say, no, I didn't understand this, or I was forced to say this. I'm not the one who then committed this offense. So the court before accepting the plea, they will then be questions that the court asks itself if whether they, uh, the client really accepts responsibility. Because you will then sign the statement as well as your client will then sign the statement. Then from there, then the court will then have to then uh, 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 satisfy itself to then say that indeed the client really accepts responsibility. I'm not sure if I've answered you. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Then what I can even highlight in terms of that, what they would normally do during consultation, your client will then come and say that, oh yeah, I just want to plead, 
plead guilty because I just want this to be over and done with. But you then explain to your client that this is prejudicial to your to to you and to your life and the consequences of what you would have then done today will be very uh, um, will be of a prejudicial nature at a later stage are you really sure do, do where why you call us to accept responsibility or not then your client will then say oh yeah so and so said if i do this then i will get this so the last summer last year we came across a matter whereby uh, it was a theft matter and the lady that was charged was not the lady that was appearing and we knew this other person because it was not for the first time this person was appearing and everybody was so shocked to see the person who is in the dog to be someone totally different and we, it later came out to be that they had a reason why they were doing that so that when the matter goes to trial then it will then end up to be that oh this is not the person when the witness points out to the to the accused in the door then it will then be no this is not the person whom i've arrested on the day in question don't don't forget that you are dealing with people who at some point not all of them some of them they've been in the game for so long so as a result of that that will then be one of the tricks that you might come upon when uh, dealing with the matter so as i say um, be very be very wary of what your clients will then have to come and we can't hear you someone is making it you understand so on the other hand um what happens in court is the client will just want to get run away from uh, whatever that they would uh, would be charged of. They just want the matter to be disposed of as quickly as possible. And due to that, they don't even care what the outcome is because like now we have so many syndicates that are operating let's say for theft cases and once one of them is arrested they just want to plead guilty as quickly as possible and then they leave and then by the time the state wants to investigate or or, or come up with sap 69s that will be late for the state so be wary of what your client will then come and say but not everyone will then be uh, malicious or come uh, with stories so that they can uh, try to run away from from the criminal justice system then uh, if you've drafted your guilty plea then you would then read it out to the record the court will accept the, your guilty plea then once they have then accepted the guilty plea then the court will ask the state do you accept the plea very important do you accept the plea if the state doesn't accept the plea then which means then that uh, the court won't accept the plea yes and then from there it will then be then that the matter will then stand down so that you can amend whatever the query the state is so to be on the safer side once you have drafted the plea make sure that you and the prosecutor are on the same level so that the prosecutor doesn't have to then uh, surprise you to then say then that hey i'm not accepting this plea because you did not admit to all the elements of the offense and again even the presiding officers they are so wary that they even you might think that they are not listening they are listening so attentively if your client you if you when you read out your guilty plea and do not admit to all the elements of the offense the court as well has a discretion not to accept your guilty plea then to then say that uh, let the matter stand down will you please admit 
what this and this and this. But if the court is not nice, they can just throw you with the with your with your um, with your uh, uh, um, statement to then say that you know what you did not do the right thing. Uh, redo your guilty plea and this will be an embarrassment to you because at the end of the day you there's members of the gallery there then your reputation is at stake so b please be very careful as, as to what you say what you include in your preparation for your guilty plea and uh, if let's say uh, furthermore then that the state then accepted your plea and then from there now we are we have moved to the stage whereby they are proving your client's previous convictions they what we call them sap 69s it's a list of records which is kept at the uh, criminal record center whereby it shows all the previous convictions that your client has been convicted of in the whole of South Africa. Should it then be that your client lied to you that doesn't he or she doesn't have previous convictions? And uh, at the time, then it then comes up then to be that he or she has previous convictions, then you will see they will even not want to look you into the eyes because they would have known that they have lied to you so what normally happens is just ask the prosecutor to then say do you have any previous convictions against my client then if they say yes then request the copy thereof go through your client with that list of previous convictions and then from there you then go through them one by one you were convicted this year this 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 and sometimes you will find that your client has been using different names of which then they then forget to then say that you can use different names but the fingerprint that is being uh, attached to your SAP 69 is one because after every conviction they take their fingerprints so once they, their fingerprints are taken then they will are kept in the record in the uh, uh, criminal record center of which they will then come if today he's so and so tomorrow he's using this other name all the names that he is using will then crop up so the other mistake that people don't uh, that people make is when let's say for instance a person was convicted while they were still young or not young by being a minor but by young being in their prime age and so forth and it happens to be that the the convictions was for 1980 or 1981 and then now when he commits an offense, now it shows up. Then you say, oh yeah, no, I forgot about that previous conviction. It was long time ago. I was young at the time. And then it then happens out to be, indeed, yes, the client was once convicted of sin. So when you uh, take instructions, please be wary of the SAP 69s because they should it then happen no matter how many years ago it will reflect on your client's list of SAP 69s so based on that uh, it's a matter of uh, of being very careful of that i see natasha has raised her hand yes sorry just a follow up question yes Natasha? Yeah. Yes, you can ask your question. Okay. Um, sorry. Say, for instance, that person admitted guilt and I got sentenced yeah. 10 years. And then um, after, say, after five years, the person that really committed the crime comes forward with proof that they actually committed the crime. What will happen then? 
But then now, as I said, um, the matter happened 10 years ago. And as a result, we would try to find out the records as to what happened back then, of which some of them might be traceable, some of them might be difficult to be traced. So if that is the case, it will then depend as to why did your client plead guilty in the first instance? Because if, let's say, for instance, maybe your client was convicted during trial, that is a different ball game. Because he would not have accepted responsibility out of his own accord, admitted all the facts as well as the elements of the offense. That would have been the discretion of the a presiding officer during trial after listening to all the evidence to then say then that uh, based on what was presented before me i then find your client guilty so there's different uh, uh, scenarios there so if your client pleads guilty is when he accepts responsibility on his own, it's going to be difficult for your client at a later stage to convince someone to then say that I did not, it was not me, I did not understand. Because they, they will read out uh, or they will play out, because normally what they would do is they will have uh, copies or transcripts, we call them transcripts, of what transpired on the day in question. Then should it then be that when reading the transcript, your client, Viva Voke admitted without anyone forcing him, is very is going to be very difficult for you to prove otherwise. So I'm not sure if I've answered your question. Thank you. Any question? Yes, ma'am. Um, can I just ask, um, you did give a, an example of a, a, an offense that was uh, that was committed like 1980, yes. or that is uh, like longer offense. Yes. Uh, isn't it at some stage, maybe for an offense of 10 years or more, shouldn't it be like erased at some stage and the record be cleaned? Or unless if I'm, uh, I'm, I got a wrong concept, thank you. Okay that we call expungement of criminal records. On its own, it doesn't disappear. It doesn't get removed. Your client is the one after 10 years has to bring an application and for the, for the criminal record to then be expunged. On its own, it doesn't. So what needs to happen is your client has to then be advised to then say that uh, after 10 years, you can bring an application. There is a process that is being done. And then you go to the nearest police station, you take all your fingerprints, and then from there, you take you there's a fee that you pay that you go to the criminal record center to have it expunged and if you did not expunge it it still stays in your name and now in 2022 you are convicted the court will not consider that because the of the 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 the, the sentence is more than 10 years old what will then the court deal with will know that you have a criminal record, but the court won't take it into consideration. Like today, I had a formal bail application of where my client was convicted in 2008 for housebreaking, and now it's 2022. So we treated it formally. We I drafted a bail application, but the court did not consider the previous uh, conviction because it was more than 10 years old. Are we clear? Thank you, ma'am. OK, any question? OK, so once the state uh, produces the list of SAP 69, the prosecutor will read it out into the record. 
So once the prosecutor reads that out into the record, then from there, before handing it in as an exhibit, then the court will ask your client to then say, do you acknowledge the previous convictions the state has read into the record? If your client then now says yes, then your client will be given uh, the last part of the SAP 69, whereby he will have to sign it. Then once he signs it, then the court orderly will take that SAP 69 and give it to the court, where the court will peruse, then they will look at such. Did he change names? When was this? What type of offense is this? This will help the court to come into conclusion as to what form of sentence will then the court gives. Then once then the court is satisfied because your plea explanation will be exhibit A, then the, the SAP 69 will be exhibit B. Then the court will then say, I'm satisfied you have admitted all the elements of the offense, you are convicted as charged. So then from there, before then uh, the court imposes a sentence, then the prosecutor will aggravate to then say that we as the state, we are of the view that uh, this is serious, the community is uh, fighting uh, or whatever the reasons are. The people are so tired, they resort to mob justice because of things happen and whatever. All the aggravating that can uh, incriminate your client. That's what the prosecutor will then have to look out for. And most of the time, the prosecutor will refer the court to the matter of S versus Z, which is a trite law whereby the court will look as to the interest of the, not only of the, the, the personal circumstances of the accused, the interest of the society, as well as the seriousness of the offense. So after uh, uh, aggravating with that, then from there, he will then say what form of sentence they would like the court to impose. So once they are done, now it's your turn. Now it's your turn as the defense to stand up and mitigate on behalf of your client. Then when he, you mitigate on behalf of your client, what will then happen is that you will read out your pet client's personal circumstances, then to then say he pleaded guilty, didn't waste the court's time, the store, if it's shoplifting, didn't uh, suffer any loss, it was just potential loss, or even if it's actual loss, but he is sorry, he accepted responsibility, and you beg with the honorable court to then say that as a first time offender, we are of the view that the court should not uh, give him a custodial sentence, or if he can be able to afford a fine, that your client should then be given an option of a fine. So after that, the court will evaluate, the court will evaluate both of what you guys have between you and the defense, and you will try to uh, reach a balance. So once the court has reached balance, then the court will then impose a suitable... Mlango, may you please mute your mic? Who doesn't look like women? Hello. Somebody uh, hasn't muted his or her mic at the background. Thank you. So as I say, um, the court will try to strive a balance between the mitigating fact factors as well as the aggravating uh, uh, factors. From there, the court will then come up with a sentence. However, the sentence might be uh, to your favor or might not go your way. But if should you feel then that what your client is facing is of a serious nature, once the court has accepted your, your guilty plea, please request a postponement so that you can get uh, the probation officer's report, whereby... Uh, 
you request uh, the, the interview on behalf of your client, whereby the social worker can have one on one to establish what is wrong? Why is your client committing offenses? Why is this happening? And should e we call it a pre-sentence report? And even though the pre-sentence report is not binding to the court, some other presiding officers, they take note of what uh, the court has, uh, what the social worker has placed on record. Furthermore, the court, should you, during your mitigation, mention that your client has minor kids, uh, children, the court will ask you, who will take care of your client should the, co the court impose a custodial sentence? Just uh, be on the alert that should then the court get to that point, which means then that the court might think of direct imprisonment. Then as a result, the court on its own accord will then suggest that let the matter be postponed, let's get a pre-sentence report so that the interest of the minor children can be taken care of. And should it then be then that your client's children doesn't have anyone to look out after or, or to be looked at by someone, then the court will then exercise an element of mercy. And what they normally say on record, it will then be, you must say thank you because you, I don't want your kids to suffer because of you. So based on that, that will as well play a very significant role. So look at what your client's uh, uh, offense is, how serious that is, what form of sentence do you think the court might impose? Should it then be then you think that the court might impose direct imprisonment? Please, please, please go for the reports. Go for the pre-sentence report as well as the correctional supervision just to see to it that you help your client not to go for direct imprisonment. Sometimes you do get them and as we all know that sentencing is in the discretion of the court, the court might rule otherwise. And that would then have been the case of many, many, many previous convictions that, that your client might have or the seriousness of the offense and the court will then feel that this amounts to direct imprisonment. So this is very, very important. And in terms of section uh, 1121B, or even in terms of section 2, where 1122, where you are representing your client, your client can raise up his hand in the door to say, uh uh, now nah, I didn't say so, or now nah, I didn't do this, or I have changed my mind, I'm no longer pleading guilty. Then the court, will then have to amend the plea of guilty to the plea of not guilty in terms of section 130 of the Criminal Procedure Act. This normally happens at the stage whereby the is before sentencing, during the proceedings before sentencing, then the client changes his mind. Or if at the time the client, the court has already sentenced your client, then your client raises his hand on, mm -mm, I, I don't know why I said I'm guilty, but I'm changing my mind. I no longer want to plead guilty. Then the court as well can still refer the matter for special review, whereby the court will have the, the, the high court then we'll have to review what transpired on the day in question as to what would have led your client to then amend his plea of guilty to that one of not guilty. And in practice, what I came across is that our clients will um, 
you know, as I said, uh, disappoint you in the dog chain, say, no, no, I'm no longer pleading guilty. Then from there, the court will then say, okay, seeing that you are no longer pleading guilty, I'm amending this in terms of section 113, then the matter is postponed for plea and trial, so that the elements that he is disputing, witnesses can be called in to come and testify about. So once your client then realizes that who today is for plea and trial and then the witness they will even ask you are all the witnesses here then when you say yes the witnesses are here then we'll say are we really proceeding with trial then you then say yes we are proceeding then we'll say i not i no longer want to uh i don't want to go for trial then you said but the last time you changed your plea from guilty to that one of not guilty. Ah, no, I thought otherwise. No, I can see in any way the court will eventually uh, convict me. But then what are my instructions? What must I then now do? Because now at the end of the day, you are giving me conflicting instructions. However, at this stage, it's not advisable for you to withdraw as attorney of record in this matter because the matter has already reached its peak stage. So what will happen is you then bring it to the state's attention to then say, hey, my instructions, my instructions have changed. Then what then do you do? How do we amend that guilty plea? Then you then have to then uh, make section 220 admissions. So you are no longer going to tender a guilty plea. Now you are tendering a section 220 admissions. And then you prepare it in a form of a guilty plea. And in that, you still have your tram lines in the magistrate court for the district of whatever held wherever the case number the names of the parties then in the terms in the tram lines in state of a guilty plea or statement in terms of section 1122 you then now say admissions in terms of section 220 of the of the criminal procedure act and then in that you then highlight you 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 say i the undersigned so and so admit uh, that i'm making this admissions freely and voluntarily nobody coerced me and all that from there you then proceed to say i'm making the following admissions take note you only admit the elements that your client disputed only that so once you have that you going to write it down from there inform the prosecutor then a normal procedure will follow as if it's a normal guilty plea but the only now the difference that it is is that no no now we are no longer saying guilty plea because he's only admitting to some of the elements that he previously disputed as a result then the court will then ask the prosecutor if he's uh, uh, accepting that after that a normal procedure convicted as charged and then from there the uh, um, the prosecutor, if there's previous convictions, will hand in the SAP 69s and your client will then be convicted. Are we okay with that? Do you understand? Any questions there? Any questions? Hey, hello, madam. Yes. You're speaking to Geoffrey Mariri? Yes. I just want to check with you. Is it possible that maybe tomorrow you can attach a template or a format on how I was supposed to draft this uh, admission of guilty and plea of a guilty as per section 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because I know it must be a way in which they they are written and then they are accepted by court. Yes, definitely so. But however, it will just be. Uh, I will just make one of say. But however, each person has his way or style of uh, of drafting a guilty plea. What I can advise you about drafting a guilty plea, I will provide you with say, but however, know your elements of the offense. And presiding officers, they are so wary and fussy about people who are repeating or regurgitating the, the annexure. Because other people, they won't even be able to draft their own annexure or, or their own uh, 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 statement. You will even hear to then say that this is just a copy of the chat sheet the state provided. So what I can say, use a layman's term. Don't come up with legal jargon, because don't forget you are the one who is writing it down on behalf of your client. So admit the, all, of, all the elements of the offense. Your client must give you a story as to what happened on the day in question. Let me give you an example of a guilty plea that I dealt with yesterday, where my client was uh, charged with robber, robbery common, that my client allegedly um, robbed this old lady of her handbag at Brooklyn Mall, and of which the handbag had its contents in. And when upon consultation with my client, then I asked him, what happened? Can you tell me your story as to what happened on the day in question? The version of my client was, he was at Brooklyn Mall, issuing out CVs for employment. Then he was pressed and went to the bathrooms. When he was coming out of the bathrooms, he then saw this other lady, old lady, coming out of the ladies' bathrooms. What happened is he just went uh, behind this lady and choked her and a scuffle ensued whereby they were fighting over that bag. And during that scuffle, that lady beat my client on his finger, and that's when the, my client managed to let go of this lady. Then the handbag and all the contents fell, and from there he, he ran away. So he was chased and he was managed to be apprehended outside uh, Brooklyn Mall. That's my client's version. So when I drafted the guilty plea, I then, I will, as I say, I will show it to you tomorrow. I, uh, the first page is standard. Then the second page is where now I'm admitting, I'm making some uh, admissions in respect of the facts as well as the elements. And then I normally start by local study by establishing who the person is that I'm the accused person in this matter and was arrested and was arrested on such and such a day, and then of which uh, I'm appearing before this court for the charge of uh, robbery common. Then I proceeded on that day. I was at Brooklyn Mall having to issue out my CVs. Then I saw this lady. I explained the story as to what happened up until my client was apprehended. Then from there, now I'm admitting to all the elements of the offense that, yes, I did assault this lady with a, a, a scuffle and suit whereby I wanted to, uh, or I grabbed her bag. That's when she beat me. I then let go of the bag. From there, I, I ran away. So I was arrested and the lady then came, identified me as the person 
who then arrested uh, uh, who then uh, are, the police came and arrested me so there's that and i then admit the unlawfulness part the intention part and that I, he didn't have any legal justification of what he has done on the day in question even though it was very sad for both parties because the lady was a 65 year old and even my client was very young and then to then say then that but why did you do this no i thought maybe if i can search the bag then i can get money but now you are you have jeopardized your prospects of now getting employment and seeing to it that maybe you might have got something in a around brook lane mall so now everybody's going to know about you to then say when you are there you rob people of their possessions and they may eventually even uh, buy you from uh, or banning you from even coming to Brook Lane Mall again. So then what I did there because I knew that my client might get three years direct imprisonment, I then requested for the report because there might be maybe a uh, social issues back home that you know let this poor he's 23 years old that let him commit what he has done so as i say i will then be able to to have something uh, written down and then you guys but please come up with your own stuff because the every person has a way of you know uh, elaborating facts and things like that if I answered you. Hello? Yes, I'm fine. Yes, madam. Okay. Yeah. I see there's I another go. hand. I see there's another hand. Yes, that's me. Yes, that's me. Yes. Um I, I, I wanted to ask, um, there was a a um a part which you have explained which I could not understand so well. Yes. Um, in, in in a situation whereby the 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 accused or the the client have decided to change his mind, um in court, can you yes. repeat that part? What then do you do as a, as 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 an um attorney? Yes. Like in this instance, the the court would have had information to say then that your client is pleading guilty let me let me uh, uh, give you how it's been done uh, in court like the prosecutor will stand up read out the charge to then say the matter is on the roll today for a guilty plea then after she he or she read out the charge onto the record then he, the prosecutor will give the charge sheet to the bench then you as the defense you stand up to say that i confirm my appearance on behalf of the accused person i do confirm that a guilty plea is in accordance with my instructions this is very important to then say you are not doing it on your own a guilty plea is in accordance with my instructions i've then prepared a statement that I'll beg leave to read it on into the court's record. Then the court will give you permission to read same onto the record. Once you are done reading the statement, then you request to hand in the statement as an exhibit. So once you hand the statement as an exhibit, then the court will ask your client questions do you confirm to what your attorney has said do you confirm the contents of this statement did you sign this statement if any of those questions then your client says no no i didn't do this no i never said this or whatever his reasons are then the court will change a plea of guilty into a plea of not guilty in terms of section 113 of the criminal procedure act then once that the court uh, announced that then the court will then say arrange a date for witnesses to be called 
for the matter to be postponed for plea and trial. The state has 14 days to call their witnesses, to subpoena their witnesses to come and testify. So after the 14 days, then your the witnesses will then be here. Then you take instructions from your client again. Are we proceeding with trial? As I say, normally they would still then say to you, are uh, witnesses here? Are uh, all the are you sure witnesses are here? And if you say yes, then they may change their instructions to say, no, Ash, that day, I don't know what happened to me. I no longer uh, want to proceed with trial. I want to plead guilty. But then now the court can now reverse a, a not guilty to a guilty. The court has to listen to the evidence of the witnesses that will be that will come forth to prove their case then should it then be that he's acquitted he'll be acquitted should it be then that he is um convicted he will be then convicted so if still he changes his mind after the 113 then now he says he wants to plead guilty again we can draft another 1122 what do we draft we draft section 220 admissions of the criminal procedure act then as i said it's still in the form of a of a guilty plea but however he is making only admissions of the facts or the elements that he was disputing. Then after that, the court will then, uh, if accepts them, the prosecutor accepts them, finds him guilty, and a normal process continues where the state mitigates, you know, aggravates, you mitigate, and then or, uh, the matter is then being finalized. I'm not sure if I've covered everything. You have covered. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes. Any questions still there, Gideon? Uh, thank, thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, there's a case uh, as versus Cook, uh, that I came across regarding conflicting instructions uh, from the client. I'm not sure. I think it's from the High Court. I'm not sure which one. And then yes. the, the the authority from that judgment is to the effect that as a as a legal practitioner, where I get conflicting instructions, uh, I'm I'm, uh, I'm bound up or I'm what's the word? In yes. This I, yes. I I can withdraw you from may, the case. You may. You may. Yes. Now, if you say uh, during the trial, it's too late in the trial to withdraw. And then if you come across such a situation, do you still continue even though uh, your client has uh, uh, put you in a predicament? The thing is, as I said, private practitioners differ from uh, legal aid uh, practitioners. Like, for instance, with me, I'm in, in this court on a daily basis. So as a result, um, even if, my client puts me in a predicament. The court already knows the person they are dealing with. You understand? So for the court to start de novo, cause which means a new attorney has to then come on record, whereby it's going to take another more than six weeks, if lucky, for the transcripts to be ready and from there it will then eventually then have to start afresh but what we normally do i normally give them the last chance to then say but you know what if you are here to play games i'm not here to play either you are guilty or not guilty what are my instructions but they would they say hey, no mama Zan, i'm so sorry i'm sorry i don't know what happened that day because don't forget even in custody they have their own lawyers they have their own prosecutors and legal advisors then they will he will then come and say i'm so sorry about the last occasion then 
as human beings, you then proceed. But however, if you are of the view that you can proceed with such, you have the right to withdraw as attorney of record, and then he will then be on his own. The matter will then start a uh, de novo with a new uh, 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 magistrate as well as a new, uh, what do you call this, the, 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 the defense attorney. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. I see Letabo. Letabo. Nyame Sizwe? Nyame Any questions? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, may I ask quickly, please? Yes. We, I'm just making an example of, let's say, uh, the accused, there's a, there's a vehicle that has been broken into. Yes. Now, uh, one uh, has managed to apprehend uh, the, the accused or the suspect. Yes. Now, going to the police station, uh, the accused is, is admitting to the fact that he broke into the car and then perhaps uh, attempted to steal a laptop yes. uh, or a cell phone. Yes. Then uh, someone else comes uh, whilst in the police station when the accused is already, you know, uh, admitting into that effect. Yes. Then that particular someone says, I was in the same vicinity and then same happened, same thing happened uh, to my to my vehicle. So, uh, and the suspicion is that this is the suspect who was around uh, the, the crime scene area uh, at the time. Now, this suspect now is admitting only to this particular uh, uh, first break in of the vehicle and then doesn't uh, admit to the other one. Yes. Now, I just want to check whether are we dealing with section 113 one, there or are we dealing with section 220? Hence, uh, there is one that he agrees uh, materially to all the elements of crime and then the other one uh, is uh, disputing that. Thank you. The first question that I have to ask, where is this happening? Is this happening, he's confessing at the police station or is he saying this to you as the legal uh, representative when taking instructions? Let's get it clear there. This is happening in the police station, and then I'm, 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 he calls me when he's still there in the police station, and yes. then uh, he's admitting, of course, there in the police station. Okay. That is in my presence as well as the presence of the of the subs, uh, that is peace officer. Yes, but then now we are going to. Uh, uh, entertain this. Is this a confession or this an admission? Because don't forget there's a difference. But however, once he accepts that, he can then be, um, his weight be taken as final. Then whoever has to, the, 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 the investigating officer has to still uplift fingerprints as to the other offense, because what will happen is they will rely on the doctrine of common purpose, but it's only when it's at the court by the prosecutor. What will happen is this other docket, the second docket, will just be joined with that other one. That the prosecutor who's reading the docket, who's deciding on the matter, will then decide as to what do I do? Do I give instructions for this second one to be investigated or am I only placing this first one whereby the, there's more, there's prima facie evidence against this suspect? So if this one where there's prima facie evidence that they are proceeding about. This is the only one that the court, the, the prosecutor rather, will place on the roll. So once he places on the roll, you come with your instructions whereby your client only accept this one and dispute this one. You can bargain with the state on that one. But however, if there's no evidence linking your client to the commission of this offense, I will uh, object to the state proceeding with that one. 
and only proceed with the one that they have prima facie case. And should it then come up at a later stage, maybe after fingerprints were uplifted or my, there's anyhow or either maybe some hair or blood that was found somewhere in that car, he can then be summoned at a later stage for him to come to court to stand for that other one. Uh, have Thank I you. answered you? Yes, I am, I'm well clarified. Thank you. Okay, then. Letabo. Okay, all right. So I, I think we are all then clear as to how section 113 kicks in and to as well as to how section 220 kicks in. Then we are now going to discuss section 114 of the Criminal Procedure Act. What happens with the section 114? Should it then be that as at the time when the court is looking at your client's uh, list of previous convictions and the court is of the view that this matter amounts sentence in the regional court or this matter uh, the 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 sentence that this court will be less or it amounts to a sentence which needs to be adjudicated or be given at the regional court, then the court will transfer your matter, will stop the proceedings in terms of section 104 and will then transfer your matter to the court in, uh, uh, in the regional court whereby your client will be faced with a sentence that is appropriate. Let's say, for instance, if your client was convicted for housebreaking, maybe he has five previous convictions of housebreaking. He has two previous convictions of theft. He has two previous or three previous convictions of fraud. All the offenses that your client has, has an element of dishonesty in and which means as part of the previous sentences that your client got exceeded the three years of the district court, then it's in the prerogative of the court to then uh, stop the proceedings and transfer the matter in terms of section 114. I see uh, Dolly has raised her hand. Dolly? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Uh, uh, do we have slides running or is my screen frozen? Yo, are they, I, I don't know. They're still frozen, but we will see to it that definitely we will get them. Okay. We, we, you. Yes. You, we, will, we, will, we will see to it that, uh, oh, okay. I see here. Oh, yes. Here they are. They are going. I'm so sorry about that. But then um, we have all the, the all the slides. Like now, with that correction of a plea, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, correction of a plea, like as I said, at any stage of the guilty plea of the proceedings, and then either in terms of any of the of the sections, but before the sentence is passed, and then that's when the court the court is in doubt that whether he accepts responsibility and all that, and then you can then go through the, the slides. I'm so sorry about that, because I, I just proceeded without even <laughs> checking whether the, the everything has then been uh, OK. I'm sorry about that. And then this is what happens when the admissions already made, then they state, they stand as proof then it's not necessary for the state to prove those facts. Then that's what I said in, uh, earlier. And then um, 
then uh, basically they just explain. It's just that what I've been saying was just in a form of uh, of uh, oral uh, theory rather. Then this is that one that by committal by district court for sentence to the regional court in terms of section 114. When does this happen? When the client pleaded guilty in the district court after conviction but before sentence this is what i said earlier to then say that when the court is of the view that the sentence the magnitude of the sentence will be uh, more than the, the 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 jurisdiction of the court is sitting that can then impose then that will then have to then be transferred to the regional court where your client will then be faced uh, with sentence from uh, 7 to, to, to 15 years. And normally, again, if your client is uh, a habitual criminal, so the court will look at the history of his previous convictions. And at some point, the court will then declare your client a habitual criminal. Once the court has declared your client a habitual criminal, then your the matter can then be tried. Even if he can steal a, a chepis or a sweetie, that is less than whatever the amount is. But because on the previous occasion, your client has then been declared a habitual criminal, once now he's been arrested, then the court sitting picks that up, then the proceeding stops and then your client will then be tried at the regional court. Then I have steps to be followed to then say the district uh, court stops the proceeding and then from there the district court commits to the accused to the regional court then a new J15 will then be uh, written at the regional court then the records will then be transcribed whereby they will then be scrutinized. And then if the court, the regional court is of the view that they are uh, satisfied that the accused is guilty, then he will then be guilty. If then the, 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 he says the, or the court is of the view that he is then not guilty, maybe he is raising a defense, then the admissions will still stand and then the trial will then commence as would have then commenced in the district court and there is a stage as well where the uh, client may try uh, to uh, apply to have the guilty uh, plea to be amended to then of that not guilty then uh, the defense has to bring an application. As I explained to the pre, one of our um, fellow colleagues who then asked a similar questions, the court has to satisfy itself as to whether it's indeed so that there, were, there was duress on the part of the accused when earlier he admitted to have committed the offense or whether he was forced or was uh, induced then as I as I said or is the shoe merely pinching the accused then from there there's that Dijakar case and then the court will then make a finding but should it then be then the court is of the view that no he's just playing games he's just playing tricks with the court the court would not even refer the matter for uh, for that special review. Then there's this case law of the Brett's case as well. If you can then uh, give go through it where the client has to give reasonable explanation why he pleaded guilty and now wishes to change. But as I say, uh, I once saw this process once happening, but the client's case didn't succeed because, as I said, then the court already asked him to then say, but I did question you. Then nobody forced you. You voluntarily on your own accord admitted to uh, 
to 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 the elements of the offense there's this case law as well of the water case if you can just um, go through it as well this is very uh, very important as well so if you then go through all these cases see to it that you understand who, at what stage where who who does what and what is the position of the of the matter then the position of change of plea after trial is that one whereby i explained to you to say that it, that is possible but the matter has then be, uh, be referred for review so you have to then bring a, a, an application for review of which then it will then be having to be had by uh, someone in the high court then or someone will come will will view it in a different way but then however uh, we have the Kokoko versus Lachranchi Lachranchi as well then we you can just go through that case law as well then this is the one where the matter was uh, when the trial was finalized then just go through everything it's just case law that you guys can uh, use in order to help you with with uh, when your your client's case has then been changed from 112 to 113 do you guys have any questions for me Any questions, beware. Um, thank you. Um, let's say you have an unrepresented um, person and they plead guilty based on section 112, but then when the questioning happens, you find that there's no mental capacity. Um, would, who has the onus to actually lead that evidence then? He who alleges must prove. So if it's you, then you have to then prove otherwise. But then now the question that will follow is, since upon consulting with your client, didn't you pick that up from the beginning? Because what normally happens is when uh, the client has a mental problem, either during their first, uh, 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 their first appearance in court, they will behave strangely or they will say things that they are not asked about or, you know, they will act somehow. And then both the defense as well as the state and the court will see that uh, uh, something is wrong here. Then before we even proceed, we then have to then uh, come up with a decision to say something is wrong, then we uh, ask maybe family members who will then support that to say, yeah, he is not of a sound mind. Then we then start the district uh, surgeon's route. The process is you, we arrange with the investigating officer whereby the client is taken to the district surgeon. Then the district surgeon will evaluate the client. Should the district surgeon be of the view that he is not of a sound mind? The IO will bring back, back the report and the court will then ask you as the defense, did you see the report? If yes, then it was like, okay, he's not of a sound mind, then the process is that he has to uh, wait for a bed at Vescopis, at the mental institution. So normally it's a tedious process, but however, sometimes it will be in the best interest of your client, sometimes not. Like today, I had two of the same, whereby uh, the district surgeon's report came out to be uh, negative, not in their favor. So they are waiting for admission at Vescopis. As I said, it's a tedious process. They have to now wait for 30 days up until they are, there is availability of a bed for them to be uh, admitted. So it might take a year, it might take months. It depends as to the 
uh, the type of offense your client is being charged with. So if it's, it has an element of violence, uh, that one, it might even take more than a year because there should be a panel sitting whereby it's more than one uh, uh, psychiatrist and then there must be a psychologist. So I think it's a panel of four people. So, and it's very difficult for all four to meet at the same time. It's, it's one of the processes that one doesn't have to go through. And what you normally come across as the defense is that family members now start feeling pity. If the complainant is a family member, they don't want to see their family member going through that process. Then now they will say, no, I no longer want to proceed with the matter. But now it's no longer in our hands. Now it's in the hands of the DPP. And there's nothing we can do. We can do up until the process is finalized. So sometimes when the they raise that when the report comes back or from the psychiatrist, then it comes back to say, no, he's fit to stand trial. Then now the normal court process starts. I don't know if I've asked, answered your question. Um, yes, but I was just asking for a person that didn't have representation. So yeah, I'm, but I'm, I'm if, guessing they would. Yeah, they if the person is not represented at some point when the court asks him questions, they, he would answer in a, in a negative way. Then at some point, the court will then be able to pick up. Then the court on its own accord will then request that uh, the proceeding stops. Then we start with the, uh, with the district surgeon's route. All right, thank you. Pleasure. Any other question? No questions. Uh, thank you guys for the lengthy period we had, but however, we'll see each other tomorrow. But I can see Lawrence has raised his hand. Lawrence and Dolly. Uh, yeah, Lawrence. No, I yeah, I just wanted to know if we, we're going to have all these slides, uh, are they going to be uploaded? on the system yes definitely they will then be uh, will we will have to upload them and you guys will definitely get them we'll organize with zuki so all right all right no, that's all. yeah no questions on my can i just ask you to just go back to the last four slides that you are on now I just need to check screenshots of the last four slides. The just from the principal. Yes. Yes, that's fine. The next one. The next one. This one. Is that the last ones? Is that the last one? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, let me, because this is the last one. I think I missed the last four slides. The last four one. Should I? Okay, thank you. Four. I think it's starting from the principles. Is it the one? Yes, thank you. Do, do you have this one? No, I don't have this one. You can continue. OK, so on this one, as I, you, you, we were talking as at the time when the, the, the plea of guilty has then been um, amended. Then, okay. yes, then the, these are the rules that uh, you as the defense will then have to then follow then for the matter to be uh, sent for review to check if everything was there any gross irregularity was there anything that happened that would not have then been uh, uh, happened on that at the time and then uh, the accused person has the honors then to can then discharge the 
all the evidence to prove to someone to then say that as at the time I did not uh, or, or I was not okay or somebody forced me or whatever the situation is. But however, seeing that um, there's a bit of some time constraints, if you can just go through them and then I will forward Zuki with my email address and then should you have any other question and then we will then attend to it. That's fine, thank you. Yes. Yeah, and before you guys uh, leave, let's try to follow the program because as I said, um, I was given a, a program that I needed to follow and then the pro I'm, I'm just going through this, uh, the topics as indicated on the, on the program. Not then that I am here, there, and whatever. It's just the, the program that was given out to me. But thanks for a lovely evening. Thank you for being uh, patient with me. Then we will then have to see each other tomorrow at 5.30 again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.